welcome to this Senate Candidate Forum on Climate and Energy Policy. My name is Adele Franks. I'm on the Steering Committee of Climate Action now. And my role tonight as moderator is to keep us on track and on time and to be sure that we follow all of our agreed upon procedures. The first task is I have a couple of announcements to make. One is please turn off your cell phones. The second is the bathrooms are straight out that door and turn right and then there are signs to direct you to the bathrooms. I have two announcements from our main sponsors. The two sponsors of tonight's event are Climate Action Now and the Northampton Democratic City Committee. Climate Action Now, which is a grassroots organization devoted to preserving a livable climate and creating a more just society, is having its regular monthly general meeting in Northampton on Monday, June 25th, that's next Monday, at 7 p.m., but its location has been changed to First Churches, which is right on Main Street in downtown Northampton. Everyone is welcome to that meeting. The second announcement is from the Northampton Democratic City Committee. They are hosting a grand opening of the Take Back the House office at 18 Center Street in downtown Northampton on Thursday, July 19th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Congressman McGovern and Mayor Narkowitz are among the officials who will be there to welcome you. And again, everyone is invited. I'd like to also thank our co-sponsors for this event tonight, the Democratic Committees of <clears throat> Amherst, Bernardston, Coleraine, Deerfield, Leverett, New Salem, Pelham, South Hadley, Sunderland, and Wendell, and 13 other organizations whose missions include preserving a livable climate. Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, the Massachusetts Sierra Club, the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, Franklin County Continuing the P Political Revolution, Greening Greenfield, Mothers Out Front Pioneer Valley, Northampton Blue Community, the Northampton High School Environmental Club, Pioneer Valley Citizens Climate Lobby, Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice, Two Degrees Northampton, and the uh, Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence Climate Action Group, as well as the Western Mass Green Consortium. So thank you to all and to the many volunteers who have helped to put this event together. And special thanks to Northampton Community Television for videotaping the event for those who can't make it here tonight in person. So here's how the evening is going to go. I'm going to introduce the panelists and then I'm going to ask each candidate to give an opening statement of up to two minutes. Then the panelists will rotate asking questions that each candidate will have up to 90 seconds to respond to. We're going to vary who goes first according to alphabetic order of first names. There are timekeepers in the front row to help us stay on time. We're going to have time tonight for nine questions at the minimum, three of which will come from the audience. So if you have a question you'd like to submit, please find one of the volunteers. Volunteers, raise your hands who have cards and you can uh, write your questions. They will turn them in. We are gonna continue asking questions until the time that arrives that we need to turn to closing statements, which will be about 8.50 p.m. so that each candidate will have two minutes remaining for a closing statement. And then we can end by 9.02 p.m. And I will be tracking the time. So, I'm introducing the panelists now. Stan Moulton is the opinion editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And next to him is Rebecca Nymark, the director of development for the Hitchcock Center for the Environment. And Jonah Keane is the Mass Audubon director of Connecticut River Valley Sanctuaries. Thank you. So now we're gonna begin with opening statements and we're gonna begin with Chelsea Klein. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to CAN and to the Northampton Democratic City Committee, and also, of course, to Britt and Adele for organizing this wonderful event. This is really lovely to be here and to talk about these important issues. So my name is Chelsea Klein. I'm running for state senate to be a strong, progressive voice for Western Massachusetts. 
I will be a champion for working families, for small businesses, and underrepresented communities. For the past six years, I've been working in higher education with adult female college students. I've been overseeing multiple academic programs from the arts and humanities to women's leadership development. All of the curriculum, the assessment, the faculty, all of those pieces. This has been deeply fulfilling work. And at the same time, I've watched my students struggle. I've watched my students face housing insecurity, food insecurity, even fearing deportation. I've watched them work multiple jobs and try to put themselves through school and take care of their children and work towards a brighter future for themselves. This is not okay with me, how many people in our area are struggling. And I know firsthand what it means to struggle. I was a low-income, single teen mother. I was on SNAP or food stamp benefits. I worked multiple jobs. I really struggled. I put myself through school. I went to Greenfield Community College. I then went on to Smith College. I got a lot of support and mentoring and scholarships and grants. And then I went on to Harvard Divinity School. My story was luck. My story was hard work. It shouldn't be that hard work and luck are the only things that allow people to succeed. I will work to rebuild our social safety net and to take care of all of the people in this, in this beautiful district. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm David Morin. I'm running for the State Senate, as you can tell. Um, thanks to the sponsors for putting this on, and thank you all, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm running for the State Senate to offer a, a, a new voice uh, for a new generation of leadership in this Commonwealth and in this country, frankly. Um, I'm deeply concerned about what's happening at the national level, and to be perfectly straightforward with you, that is what, that's what's prompted me to get in this race. Actually, to get back into politics, um, I've been involved with the Democratic Party for, for about 10 years. Um, I've held numerous um, leadership positions at the local and state level, particularly with the Young Democrats of Massachusetts and the uh, local chapter of the Young Democrats of Massachusetts, the Pioneer Valley Young Democrats. And um, I've, I've also been involved in student government at Holyoke Community College and at UMass, where um, I attended uh, for my undergraduate studies. I'm currently a graduate student at UMass. And um, a, apart from being um, you know, a, a voice for a, a new generation, um, I'm really looking to, to change the climate of um, campaign finance by not accepting any campaign contributions. That's a, a, a bold and um, revolutionary um, idea, I think, and it's not one that I think that my opponents will share, um, but I'm, I'm doing that because that's really what I believe in, and I think that um, with our great uh, media outlets here and with our great community organizations, um, I think that the, in our incredibly informed and active electorate, um, this is a time and this is a place where something like this can really happen. And I look forward to sharing my experience with you, um, sharing my passion, and um, hopefully um, working for you as your next state senator. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dave Murphy. I'm from Amherst, and I live in Amherst. I um, decided to run for the state senate because with the resignation of Stan Rosenberg, the recent retirement of um, Ellen Story, the passing of Peter Cocott, and the retirement of John Seibach and Stephen Kulik, we're collectively losing almost 100 years of legislative experience for this district. As you know, Western Mass tends to get forgotten on Beacon Hill, and I think it's critical that we send somebody up to the Senate who knows the district, but also knows how to get things done on Beacon Hill. I spent uh, about 20 of the past 25 years working in government um, to try to positively impact the lives of the people of Massachusetts. Um, after college, I worked for Governor Mario Cuomo in New York City. Then I worked for Senator Ted Kennedy on Capitol Hill. 
I worked for the U.S. Department of Justice in the Clinton administration, and then I worked for Bob Mueller in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Homicide Unit. After law school, I went, uh, I came back to Massachusetts and I worked in the Superior Court. I worked at a Boston law firm, and then I, Stan Rosenberg helped me get my first job on Beacon Hill as general counsel to Senator Harriet Chandler, and uh, then later as general counsel to Senator Mark Montigny. So I spent five years working in the state Senate. I spent the next five years working for uh, Governor Deval Patrick as the legislative director at the Department of Children and Families. Um, I learned about the legislative process from Ted Kennedy. I've been doing this most of my life, and, I, and uh, it's very important to me that this district is represented and that we have somebody who um, has uh, spent time working on Beacon Hill, um, knows how to pass legislation. Um, I have friends who are senators, house members, and advocates, and uh, the way to get things done is by working with others. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Cumberford, and I want to thank the organizers and co-sponsors of this evening's uh, conversation and debate, and I also want to give a special special shout out to Ken and all of the sister organizations for the very sweeping and wonderful victory of the Senate Energy Bill that passed. Yeah, we should. We should. That passed last week in the Senate. I want to say that this is your victory. It's your victory, and it's the result of countless hours of advocacy. So global climate change, as we know is the greatest threat sweeping our nation. Right now, the average American produces about 20 tons of carbon, or CO2, annually. Client scientists tell us that number should be one. One ton, not 20. So we need big, bold, unyielding legislation. And the question on the table for us tonight as candidates is what are we prepared to do if elected? So I just want to share a little bit of my track record. While I haven't focused singularly on climate in my career, I certainly have had opportunities to be an ally. So while at the American Friends Service Committee, I joined an initiative uh, led by regional organizers to help close Mount Tom Power Plant. While at Move On, I marshaled Move On member forces to stand in solidarity with indigenous leaders to block the Dakota pipeline. While at National Priorities Project, my team crunched budget numbers, budget numbers for energy and climate so that advocates could make their voices heard. I also had the ability as in my personal capacity to help close Vermont Yankee by joining an affinity group and risking arrest with Francis Crow. So putting my body on the line with others, many, many in this region, to help close that dangerous nuclear power plant. So, what I want to tell you today is that I believe in my own deeds and in my own actions over the years that I am a very fierce climate activist and I really look forward to this evening's conversation. Thank you, my name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the president of the city council here in Northampton and I'll just be very blunt and tell you what you probably know better than I. Uh, we are not even close to doing what we need to do to solve the climate emergency we are in in our world, and we are not close to doing what we must do in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do that same thing. Now, on Friday, not Climate Action Now, not the Sierra Club, not Environment Massachusetts, but National Grid came out with a statement and, and they said exactly the same thing, that we aren't going to make even half of the, of the benchmark under the Global Warming Solutions Act for climate, uh, for carbon pollution reduction by the 2050 deadline that we need to. We're living at a time when we need urgent leadership on climate change and that leadership is not going to come from the executive. We have a governor who had to be taken to court to even enforce the Global Warming Solutions Act. What we need are legislative leaders who are going to unambiguously and passionately fight to address the, the climate emergency that we are in. And I think many of us in the room agree with that. And I think we're gonna talk about specific proposals of how to do that tonight. 
But the overriding thing that I really believe is that if you agree with that, then we should elect a state senator who is ready on day one to work on that urgent legislation for the Commonwealth, for the region, and for the country. Uh, I think I'm the only elected official on stage. I think I'm the only one who has written local legislation, built support for it, and got my colleagues to vote for it. That kind of skill, I think, is essential in an institution like the State Senate, because that is where change is going to happen. I will use all of my skills to fight for that ideal in the State Senate. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Steve Connor, and I'm also running for State Senate. I absolutely believe Massachusetts can reach the goal of 100% clean, renewable energy. As Joe had said, a good step is today's approval of the Massachusetts Senate and Act Combating Climate Change, a revenue-neutral carbon fee designed to incentivize low-emission lifestyles and business practices. As we look at the conditions in this state and across the nation, as a matter of fact, even around the world, climate change is challenging everyone to do better and now. Clean, accessible water is vital for our existence. Droughts that we've had suffered uh, right here in the Northeast over the last several years, and overuse and misuse of our water resources is very concerning. I am so afraid of the conflicts that are on the horizon everywhere over water use. Businesses need to do better, individuals like you and I need to do better. The first Earth Day was uh, in 1970. We've come a long way since then on many issues. I remember when people thought we couldn't solve the problem of acid rain and the effects on this environment and on our structures. We solved it. There are some things we can do right away, like restoring the metering, metering credit for low-income solar and requiring electric utilities to create resilient smart grids. I will advocate for these and for the resources of the Commonwealth to incentivize our transition to 100% renewable energy sources. I am not an expert on the science regarding climate change, but I am smart enough to listen and know that, learn from the scientists and the policy think tanks um, of concerned citizens of this district on what a community needs to do and what I have to do here and now as your new state senator if I am elected. Thank you. Now that we have finished the opening statements, I'm going to ask the audience to no longer clap after each person because that'll give us more time to have questions answered. The first question is going to be offered by Stan Moulton, and Dan Moran will start the answers. David Moran, excuse me. <laughs> Did you say Dan? That's OK. <laughs> People call me Dan sometimes. OK. Uh, there is growing concern in the scientific community about the cost of inaction on climate change. Some view it as an emergency warranting a response from the global community that is similar to what occurred in response to World War II. Where would climate change rank on your list of legislative priorities, and what would be your first initiatives to address climate change at the state level and to promote clean energy? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, in terms of my uh, priorities, I would probably say that climate, solving climate change is not my number one priority. Um, I, I think that I would be working um, on economic justice issues, and um, I would be diving into things like criminal justice reform. Um, but I would absolutely um, seek the um, advice and assistance of experts, um, of community organizations, um, such as the sponsors here tonight, um, and you all here in terms of um, uh, just you know, learning what all of the, um, the issues are um, regarding climate change, what uh, legislative um, remedies can, could, be, um, could be found. Uh, one, one thing that I think that I would absolutely um, write in terms of a bill uh, would be a, um, a permanent um, ban on, on fracking. Um, I don't think a moratorium is um, what we need. I think that we need a, an absolute ban. And um, also, I think that we need just, uh, we don't need as many pipelines 
um, as have been talked about. I think in Western Mass, we're particularly vulnerable here. Um, I think that we have the energy uh, that we need. We need clean energy. We need wind power. Um, we need more options. Um, we shouldn't be relying on fossil fuels so much. Um, but as I said, I would uh, work with my colleagues and with my constituents um, to, to get where we need to be on that. Dave Murphy. Climate change is an issue that spans a number of issues. We need to treat climate change like the public health and, and child health emergency that it is. In addition, climate change gives us the opportunity to, to treat it as an economic issue because the state and the nation that leads in clean energy and renewable energy technology is going to lead the globe not only in reducing um, the effects on the environment, but also it, they're going to have the most expansive and the most vibrant economy in the future. So, it, it, you know, this is an issue for me that, that is multifaceted and that is critically important. Clearly, we're not doing enough. I think Massachusetts should be a leader like California has been in reducing emissions and, and reaching our target goals. Um, I, frankly, I don't think that the bills um, in the legislature go far enough because they uh, are not going to get us to the goals that, that have been set for 2035 and 2050. So I'd like to see us do more. I, I think we need to have an omnibus bill that, that uh, covers multiple issues and takes this, this issue on, on many levels. I believe in, in fighting battles on every front, and this is an issue that we cannot afford to lose. We have to take action now. Thank you. Joe? For me, climate change is really central to all of the other intersecting issues like economic justice, like health care, uh, that are central to my platform. I think about it three different ways. I would focus on incentives for renewable energy in the form of things like renewable portfolio standards and also busting through the cap of net metering to allow people to contribute back to the grid. I would then also focus on disincentives like carbon pricing. So right now, Massachusetts, we pay $20 billion to import fossil fuel. That money should be used in this commonwealth to develop renewable energy. So we have to create disincentives for people to continue to use fossil fuels. And then I think about climate justice. And I think about the absolute critical nature of bringing those most affected by climate change to the table so that they have the voice that we need we all of us need to tell the story about climate change in our midst. So I'm talking about people who are struggling with, say, for example, asthma, people in homes riddled with lead paint, people who face the incursion, the, the incursion of uh, failing crops or fear water loss. These are the people whose voices we have to elevate because we have to together sound the alarm and together take the kind of bold action that we need to take in the legislature. I think of, of your legislators, you should demand that they, they treat many issues with urgency, and it's, it's hard to rank them. Uh, climate change is going to be an issue for the foreseeable future, and it needs urgent action now. I think let's, let's look at the, the legislation that the Senate passed. Now, if, for, if by some miracle, and I, I hope for miracles all the time, I'm a write-in candidate after all. <laughs> <laughs> um, the House of Representatives passed. Usually the Senate passes good, leg, good progressive legislation, the House doesn't act. But if they act, we still have some serious things to figure out because the actual language of that Senate bill doesn't actually prescribe a method of carbon pricing. It just directs the executive to do it. So there are major questions, and I can tell you the features that I would want in a carbon pricing. I would first want uh, to make sure that those who are economically disadvantaged aren't even more so. So I would want to see the, the money rebated back to people uh, as well as invested in infrastructure. And I would want to see quarterly dividend, pay, uh, dividend payments so that people don't suffer economically while we're doing what we have to do for climate justice. I also think it's important that we transform our electric grid and our energy system. We need to move from a big 
New England-wide system to a series of resilient microgrids. We need to revolutionize our energy system in the Commonwealth, let solar flourish, let wind flourish, and embrace a clean energy future for Massachusetts. Steve. Hi, I believe um, that climate change is such a priority for all of us that, of course, it would be at the top of my list. We need to continue to use the power of our government to address the needs. We also need to feel free to keep adding on more and more expense to make businesses, corporations find that using fossil fuels, biofuels, nuclear energy is more expensive than allowing us to put up solar panels and to build those windmills offshore and around the country so that we can have renewable energy. It's a crime that we are so behind Europe. I went several years ago to Greece and I couldn't believe every house seemed to have a solar panel on it and it's incentivized all the time. We need to do that in the state of Massachusetts and the country as a whole. Um, the other thing we need to address is recycling. As we sit there and do our recycling, we put it all together and then we ship it. The amount of fuel to ship it off to poor countries to have them do our dirty work, I think we have to step back, look at that, and say, that's really not helping. We have to have education on all of this stuff. Thank you. Chelsea. I was chatting with a group of mothers recently, and we were talking about what keeps us up at night, and my immediate answer was global warming. This is serious. This is scary. We all know this, and yet I think a lot of us feel helpless which is partially why I'm running for office, that I'm a woman of action, and enough is enough. It's time for us to take change, make change. So currently, only half a percent of the state budget in Massachusetts goes towards environmental concerns. This has been steadily decreasing since 2009. So I support the Green Budget Coalition, which would increase the budget for environmental concerns. Um, I really believe that we need a diverse portfolio of green energy options, that we need to invest in multiple options. I really believe that you know, we've had the, the strongest climate mandates in the nation, and along with California and New York, um, and thanks to the global warming solutions um, of 20, um, 20, uh, 2008, excuse me. Um, but we will soon fall behind if we are moving forward with these smart regulations that will decrease the incentives for solar. I am, oh, I'm running out of time, pardon me. Um, so I want to push for wind energy. Um, I want to push for energy efficiency options. Um, I think that we should invest invest in electric vehicles and their infrastructure, um, and I believe that we should invest in public transportation, and all of these things working together can hopefully keep us relevant and keep us protecting this planet. Thank you. The second question will be asked by Rebecca Nymark, and Dave Murphy will answer it first. Transportation in Massachusetts is the major source of carbon emissions. On Monday, the Massachusetts Supreme Court struck down the ballot initiative proposing a millionaire's tax that would have funded education and transportation. Meanwhile, another popular initiative calling for a drop in the sales tax from 6.5% to 5% is poised to be added to the ballot. Sales tax is the second largest source of state revenue and provided 48% of the MBTA budget in 2017. Without the millionaire's tax, and with a possible reduced state sales tax, how do you propose to fund greener transportation? That's a great question. So I've worked on 12 budgets at the State House in the time that I worked for the state. And we have a structural deficit in our, our budget because for a generation we've been cutting taxes, uh, particularly on corporations and the wealthy. Um, and we currently lack the resources to invest in education, in uh, transportation, in infrastructure, affordable housing. Um, so with regard to the, the millionaire's tax, um, I'm not a big fan of amending the Constitution, but in this case, I, I think what we should do is go back and uh, amend the Constitution to give the legislature the flexibility to implement a graduated income tax. 
Um, the last time we tried this was in 1994. Uh, it, it was defeated, but if you recall, as I do, in 1994, uh, the Democrats took a beating across the country, and it, it uh, was the midterm elections uh, after uh, President Clinton was uh, inaugurated as president in 1992. I believe that in 2020, we have an opportunity to amend the Constitution to give the, the legislature the flexibility to address the, the imbalance in our budget and to give us the resources we need in order to invest in transportation, um, infrastructure, education, and the other important issues like health care. As executive director of National Priorities Project, which is a budget research organization, my team and I looked at the federal budget, we cracked it open, and we traced those numbers spent on energy and the environment down to the states like the Commonwealth and down to local communities. And we did that to help talk and help people talk about the impact of federal spending at, in, at the state level and at the municipal level. So I have a great familiarity both with tax and spending priorities and how to look at budgets with, through that lens uh, of a budget analysis lens. So what I would do in terms of the work at the state legislature is look at corporate taxes or tax expenditures as they're called and certainly be an advocate uh, for looking at the ways in which we can and should raise taxes on corporations in Massachusetts it's absolutely doable. We have to come with a strategy to do it. I would also, of course, defend us not lowering the sales tax. Uh, it's very important that we have that source of revenue. And then I would look at spending priorities within the Massachusetts budget. Right now, we spend money in places that we can divert to energy, to infrastructure, to education. And I would look at places like actually incarceration, which is a huge portion right now of our budget. And I would look with legislatures and legislators at places we could divert those funds for necessary transportation and environmental projects. Public transportation is not a luxury. It's something we need to connect people to affordable housing, to good jobs, and to opportunity. I grew up in affordable housing in Amherst, in an apartment complex called Rolling Green off of Route 9, and I remember very clearly taking the PVTA all the time with, with my mother to um, the things that we had to do in our lives. It frustrates me to no end that we have a governor who insists on level funding public transportation. Uh, this is an ongoing structural problem in the Commonwealth, and it is a social justice issue at the end of the day. This is a social justice issue. So let's be very clear about the need to invest in our communities, transportation chief among them. Um, and let's also be clear that the fair share amendment, while that would have raised new revenue in a progressive way, and I completely supported it, I'm disheartened by the decision of the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, the rest of the revenue, you know, the majority of the $41.5 billion state budget was still going to be raised in the status quo way. The legislature can't just depend on a ballot measure. It has to take ownership and leadership and fight for a progressive tax code. We need to raise the earned income tax credit in the state of Massachusetts, and we need to close corporate tax loopholes, which cost literally billions, billions of dollars a year. Let's invest differently in the state. Transportation is a huge issue, in, especially in Western Mass and in this district, especially in our rural communities. So we have to come up with a smarter way of handling it. Number one, I think it's really important that all municipalities and all states look at turning all of the vehicles into electric vehicles rather than fossil fuel run diesel and gas. I think that would be a big start. I also feel like if we do not get the, car, the Fair Share Act rewritten, then we need to get the legislature to have a constitutional amendment to pass that tax. When it comes to the sales tax, it's always made me crazy that 
one penny off of all of those taxes goes to the MBTA, and then the rest of us with the regional transit authorities have to beg for any money. I think it's the responsibility of the state to do all the transportation and not put regionalization on there and MBTA up at the top. Uh, that's the voice we have to bring from Western Massachusetts. The other thing I would say is if there is a drop in the tax, which I think is crazy, then the newly passed carbon fee that was added, I would then push to say, okay, rather than it going back, we're going to have to keep that to keep our mission to get to 100% renewable and have clean vehicles. Thank you. Chelsea. I agree that access to public transportation is a social justice issue. I can't tell you how many students I've had that haven't been able to get to jobs or get themselves to school or get their children to school because they didn't, the bus were, buses weren't running or the line had been closed or whatever. So this is a very important issue, clearly. Um, why not have a progressive income tax system? Why are we allowing GE and Amazon to have massive tax breaks? There could be opportunities in some of those questions to allow more um, revenue to be generated to support these basic essential needs that we have out here in Western Massachusetts. I also am inspired by the REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a very creative solution, which is a coalition between 10 different states um, that have done market-based carbon pricing program for the power sector. <laughs> The money from the, from, that's generated from these nuclear power plants goes right into the Green Communities Fund, and it pays for green initiatives. I would love to work on something similar to us, for us, to look for creative solutions to find revenue so that we can take care of Western Massachusetts and get us even greener. That's, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I do not support um, the drop of the, the sales tax. Um, that's something that I, that I would be interested in considering if there were there was a um, you know a thought out plan to actually offset um, that decrease in revenue, but there doesn't appear to be. Um, so that's that's something that I could support right now or vote for. Um, yeah, the the SJC decision to um, to not allow the um, fair share amendment um, to go to the ballot is is deeply disheartening and, and disappointing. And I did support the fair share amendment. And um, I, I think that there are uh, a, a lot of different ways that we could um, go about um, bringing that, those, those, um, those goals forward. Um, legislatively, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Murphy that um, you know, we, we, we need a constitutional amendment um, to allow for a progressive uh, tax code. Um, we need our, I agree with um, Councilor O'Donnell that we need our legislators to absolutely step up and um, take responsibility for that and, and, and do that um, through uh, the constitutional amendment process. Um, we do totally need to focus on public transportation. Um, I'm, you know, the, the, the overall uh, budget mix is, is very complex, um, but we are, we are getting the short end of the stick out here in Western Mass. It's not fair. We need. Um, east-west rail, we need uh, fully funded PBTA, we need clean um, energy, or excuse me, transportation options such as uh, electric buses. Um, thank you. Thank you. The third question comes from the audience and Jonah is going to ask it and Joe Cumberford answers first. How will you work with businesses and industry to achieve significant energy conservation? And what ideas do you have for encouraging green manufacturing and green technology jobs in Western Mass? That's a great question. So I see the business community as key stakeholders to the Commonwealth's movement toward zero emission and toward 100% renewable energy. I see businesses as partners because we all have a stake in our climate, we all have a stake in the kind of work that we know we need to do as a commonwealth and as a nation. So first, I would work uh, with willing businesses uh, toward making the case, which we know is, is evident and viable through so much research, about the wealth of green jobs that are available as we invest in green technology and begin to disinvest and thus liberate that money 
uh, from fossil fuels. So I would work toward um, developing, uh, to putting more money into research and development, to putting more money into job training, creating pipelines for workers with these newly needed and harvested skills to be able to put them to work in our local businesses. I would begin to incentivize that kind of work through grant programs. And I would begin, in fact, to work more regionally with businesses because we know that when we get scale, everyone benefits. So when we get scale, the kind of ideas that we have here in the Commonwealth move out into New England and then businesses everywhere and the economies everywhere as a result lift up. Well, as I think everyone knows, there's recently, recently been a major drop in solar installations in the Commonwealth. And one of the major reasons is the fact that we have an artificial net metering cap that's in place. Uh, I just want to drive home how essential it is for the legislature to abolish that cap. Um, we need solar power to flourish in the Commonwealth. And when it does, I think there is an economic benefit that flourishes along with it. Um, I think we need to build on our strengths. And that could be one of our, our places where we lead in the whole country. Let's look at a local strength here in Western Mass. Let's look at the University of Massachusetts. Now, there's been a, a fairly successful effort to use some of the resources of Western Mass to help develop new battery technology. Battery technology and storage being absolutely essential if you want to transform our energy system, because you can generate as much wind and solar as you want, but if you can't store it for later use, um, it's obviously not uh, something that is workable. Now, let me add one final thing. Uh, when we talk about businesses, what about our local farms? Uh, this is a, a district that has 24 cities and towns, and agriculture is very important to a lot of people uh, in this Senate district, and I'm going to fight for them as much as I'm going to fight for other kinds of, of employers. Now, farms face special challenges with climate change, higher temperatures, more evaporation, you know, uh, this kind of thing, and there are actually state programs to help mitigate climate change for local farms. We need to support those as well. Yes, um, I think it's time to look a little bit to the past, as I had spoken before about the acid rain issue that we faced many years ago. We address that not just in Massachusetts, but throughout the Northeast, because a lot of the stuff was coming from the Ohio and from Michigan, and it was flowing our way. We also got Canada involved in it. This is going to take that kind of solution for our region to address, and with that will come the businesses. The businesses were on board before. It has to come from incentives by the state governments and the federal government to make it possible. I think it's possible to do that, and we have to work collectively. What I also would say is here in our district, we have a great opportunity. We have one of our greatest resources is the educational facilities that we have. UMass has been working on renewable energy. We need to keep working towards that. But places like GCC are perfect to do all the training for new green jobs, for people to find work, leave the fossil fuel industry, leave those, and end up working on solar installation, make sure that all businesses new have solar panels if they're aligned to do so, and work at all new building and new housing that happens, and get good jobs to people working in clean energy. Thank you. To support our businesses in being leaders in Massachusetts as far as protecting our planet and providing jobs, I believe that we absolutely need to lift the net metering cap. We definitely need to incentivize solar, not pull back from that. I think we need to incentivize organic farming and certainly support our farmers and create green jobs from top to bottom and support our businesses in doing that. Um, I know that we are on the brink of doing some really big things with wind energy offshore with, uh, on, the Marth on Martha's Vineyard, and we have the UMass Wind Energy Center right here. We have brilliant minds right here that could help us to um, do a job training, to work on the engineering and the design, to work on the building components. So we have a lot of these pieces in place, and it could be that we could definitely be major national leaders in that way. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is this is a, a great question, and I think it's it's complex because we, we want 
obviously to protect our environment, but at the same time we want there to be business and, and jobs and uh, a thriving economy. And I think oftentimes uh, those two things come, come into conflict with another, you know, whether it's uh, um, pollution or uh, it, the, the business isn't, you know, living, living up to um, uh, other standards that we have um, uh, with, our, with our laws and regulations. Um, so I, I think that we could really um, reach out to a lot of um, businesses that aren't currently in Massachusetts. Um, we could provide incentives or offer incentives um, to them, um, tax incentives, um, just our great opportunities in terms of uh, our, our cities, our, our, our towns, um, our incredible um, landscape and um, uh, communities that we have here. Uh, so I, I, would, I would be very, very much engaged in that and um, hoping to, to work with, with businesses and business leaders um, to uh, not only uh, you know make sure that our economy is is strong, um, but to to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to protect um, our people and our environment. We have some of the brightest minds and greatest uh, institutions of higher education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think that the state needs to partner with the private sector, with the financial uh, industry sector, with business and with our institutions of higher education to um, invest in, in clean and green energy. So fossil fuels are the thing of the past. The future is green and clean energy. And, and currently, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And soon, it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. So I, I think that, that we need to partner, work together, and help the Commonwealth be a leader in green and clean um, and renewable energy and technology so that we can lead the, the nation and the world in having an impact on uh, improving our environment and saving the planet. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Stan and Ryan will answer first. Uh, this is a multiple part question about carbon pricing. Some of you have touched on carbon pricing already, but this will give you the opportunity, all of you the opportunity, to address it in depth. Um, carbon pricing is, is a key to reach Massachusetts carbon emissions targets. California has a successful model that shows that economic growth is possible while regulating climate change. Do you favor carbon pricing, and, and particularly, uh, if so, what form for example, a fee and rebate with all the money going back to the people and businesses so it's revenue neutral, or fee and rebate only part of the funds so the state keeps some for green uh, infrastructure, or a cap and trade uh, uh, a form of, of uh, carbon pricing. And, and, and as a second part to that, how would you protect rural residents who rely on their vehicles for transportation as well as people who are barely getting by financially from the burden of having to pay more for fossil fuel. Thank you. I think that carbon pricing is essential. Uh, I think there's consensus about that. I don't think we can reach our goals to reduce carbon pollution, which is driving climate change, unless we have that. And I was pleased to see the Senate take action on a bill which included carbon pricing. But as I mentioned, these details are important. So what I favor is a mixed system. Um, first of all, I should back up. At the end of the day, what I favor is whatever we can get done Im immediately, because that's the kind of urgency we need, that we need to have. But what I favor kind of philosophically is a mixed system that invests some of the revenue in a green bank to build green infrastructure that we, that we need. You know, let's build out, for example, electric charging stations. Let's provide grants for climate mitigations, mitigation to different communities. But let's also rebate some of this fee to people who are struggling in a, in a progressive way. I think that's very important. And that transitions in the second part of your, your question, Stan, which is how do you deal with rural areas where you must have a car and you have to drive? I think of this, this is like how I think we should change the, the funding formula for rural school districts and create kind of a sparsity aid component. Um, I think we need to have a formula that takes uh, each of the different areas of the Commonwealth into account. 
we can do this, we can have a carbon fee to uh, challenge climate change, but we can do it in a way that is equitable and doesn't hurt people who are struggling economically. In fact, it can lift us up. Hi, yes, Dan. Uh, I too believe that carbon pricing is a key component for us to be successful in reducing greenhouse grass gases. I am supportive of the Senate's version that was just um, passed and is going to the House of using it as a um, revenue neutral. However, as I had stated before, I feel like if we lose any of our taxes off of the sales tax, again, one cent goes to MBTA, that's not going to be affected, it's going to affect the rest of us, then that tax, that revenue neutral goes away and we keep the revenue to both work on purchasing electric vehicles, electric um, buses, and making more access into the rural areas. They will continue to need to get some type of rebate. The rest of it should be through smart design of neighborhoods. We need to put people, schools, and jobs in locations where we don't have to have people travel so far. We can build in incentives for that. We can make it easier for workers. We can make it easier for everybody. Those that have lots of money can live out where they like, and they will pay the extra money that they will need. But it's going to take a transition, and we, couldn't, we shouldn't hurt the rural areas as we do that. I do agree, though, with Ryan that if that doesn't work, cap and trade is another option and let them work from that perspective. But something has to be done and it has to be done now. I have mixed feelings about carbon pricing. It's very contentious because it overly burdens our rural residents who have to drive farther or travel farther to get to a job or to school. And that's not fair. I think that we should be taxing our biggest carbon producers, of course, um, and have them pay a fee. I would rather not low-income or rural people um, bear the burden or have to pay, have to pay for, their, um, for their daily lives. That being said, I think if we invest in electric vehicle infrastructure and make it easier for people to actually get electric vehicles, then that would mitigate some of that. I also think that if we invest in community shared solar and allow communities to uh, own and operate and maintain their own solar power, then that would help. Um, I'm a very strong proponent of environmental justice. I really believe that we should be protecting the, the low income and the vulnerable people among us from having to bear the burden of climate change um, and that they shouldn't be paying more, they shouldn't be more vulnerable than the rest of us. So where we are investing, we should also be sharing the benefits and we should be protecting our planet and protecting our people simultaneously. Thank you. Um, I, I do support uh, carbon pricing, and I don't think that it should be revenue neutral. Um, I, I, I agree that th there are concerns um, with our, especially with our rural residents, and out here in Western Mass, uh, we are just relying on, uh, you know, our cars uh, a lot more, more so than I, folks in, in Boston, for example. Um, so again, we need the the east-west rail. That's not going to do it for everyone out here. It's it's just not. We need uh, more investment in PVTA. We need um, more options, um, you know, maybe smaller um, buses that are going out to uh, the um, uh, rural areas. Um, perhaps even something like um, self-driving cars could be in the mix later on down the road, and that's something that we should explore. Um, but we, abs we absolutely need to um, come up with uh, solutions um, for this uh, pollution. I personally wish that my car did not pollute so much. It really does, and it, it's, it's terribly unfortunate. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I need to get around, and I, it's, a, it's an important, um, you know, I, I, there's, I, I don't have many options. So when I, you know, when I, when I, take the, when I do take the bus, I, I do when I can, but um, you know, there's only so much we can do on a personal level. So uh, the government, I think, needs to step up, and maybe it's gonna, you know, uh, People are going to take a hit, um, but I think it's going to be uh, for the better for all of us. We need broad-based carbon pollution fees. Uh, we need to uh, have a minimum of 20% go to the Green Infrastructure Fund, and we need to uh, provide rebates to um, 
you know, lower income and uh, rural communities so that they're not unfairly burdened by a, a carbon tax. Um, one of the, the most significant um, impacts on the environment in Massachusetts is our public fleet. So um, one of the things that our uh, green infrastructure fund should go to is converting the public fleet to uh, electric and uh, helping people to buy hybrids and electric cars so that um, we can have a greater impact on uh, the pollution in Massachusetts. Um, transportation is the number one factor that creates uh, pollution, and uh, so I think that it's, it's a combination of these issues that will have uh, the greatest impact. So as folks here know, we are just not paying for the true cost of fossil fuels. And for this reason, I do support uh, carbon pricing. I support a mixed model, however. I support both a green, sort of a partial green bank so that we build resources to re invest in renewable energy, and I support a rebate so that especially directed to people who are living in low-income communities or rural communities. And in terms of where I would want to invest in a green infrastructure, I'd also want to go first into communities, rural communities, and disproportionately low-income communities, and invest in green technology in those communities, invest in transportation in those communities. So as we begin what we must do, a sweeping overhaul in our commonwealth, we are taxing, or putting a price on carbon, and we are using that money where people need it most in terms of rebates and in terms of the kinds of development that we know we need. And from there, we build out. And that's the way that we can transition our economy and our renewable energy commitment, but starting from a justice model, so for those who need it most first. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Rebecca, and uh, Steve will get the first response. The Department of Public Utilities will pay, play a pivotal role in how fast we increase use of clean renewable energy and in the location and construction of fossil fuel infrastructure, such as gas pipelines. In the past, the Department of Public Utilities has allowed little or no public input in their proceedings, not even from legislators of the districts directly affected. Do you support legislation that would make the DPU more transparent and require them to allow residents, municipal office officials, and legislators to participate in their proceedings? Absolutely. I think it's, when we're talking about a public utility that is for the public and all the information that the public needs to support what they're doing has to be out there. We have to know what they're doing. We also need to have our legislatures and all of us have a greater role in the decision making that happens there. It's our money they're getting. We, if, if they cannot provide what we need and the information that we need to make the best choices, then the public utility um, division should find more and more penalties. I, do not believe there's any need to have a, uh, any more, um, I'm drawing a blank, pipelines across the state or anywhere. It's only going to keep encouraging more use of fossil fuels and alternatives. We need to switch over to more wind, more solar. We have to have our public buildings go solar. So uh, uh, thank you. Sorry. I think it's very interesting that the name that the DPU has allowed for people who want to actually speak back to them is an intervener. I think that tells us a lot. Their interest is in their bottom line and they do not want people intervening in that. Apparently they have a very regimented process and they are considering allowing people to intervene by speaking back to them. So I would absolutely very strongly support any kind of legislation that would insert the public voice into our utility companies. 
At the same time, I think that we can resist having to buy into their systems and lining their pockets, essentially, by investing in community solar. Um, and that, I mean, the fact that 80% of homes in, in Massachusetts are not compatible for rooftop solar means that if we invest in community solar, then we're allowing communities to take charge of their electricity, of their energy needs, and they're able to maintain it, they're able to um, repair it themselves, and it allows them to come to, individuals to come together to have affordable, clean, accessible energy. So yes, I think that we should intervene in the DP, DPU, and we should talk back, and we should tell them what we need as, as individuals and as people who are concerned citizens, and I also think that we can do more and do better outside of their structure. I, I think that um, all of us up here um, would be great interveners um, on this issue and others. Um, that, that's very frustrating. I, I, I mean, there's an open meeting law. Um, there, I feel like even in situations where there's so much stuff on the agenda or um, there's, you know, you can always go into an, an executive session or something, but you should always have an opportunity uh, for, for the public really to, to get involved and to at least be able to express um, their opinions. And, and as, as a state senator, that's something that I would do uh, very aggressively. Um, so, so, I mean, is, is a legislative fix I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that a, legisl a legislative um, solution is even needed in this situation. But if if it's you know things are going like that, then absolutely, yeah, I, I would be uh, all over that as a state senator, and um, I would I would be organizing um, you know actively um, to uh, put in um, that that sort of environment uh, not only with the, with the DPW but with all of our uh, public agencies. I would absolutely support legislative initiatives to overhaul the DPU. Um, I think it's a disgrace that um, the agency is not transparent and it seems to act in effect as, uh, you know, in collaboration with the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. Um, so I, I would absolutely um, do whatever needs to be done in order to overhaul the department and to make it more effective, more open, more transparent, and um, you know, so that they actually do what they're supposed to be doing. You know, if we have to abolish it and start from scratch, that's fine with me. I am also in favor of a much more accountable, much more transparent DPU. People, stakeholders in local communities, local elected officials, the media all have a stake in what happens in our local communities with regard to energy and the environment and things that matter to our communities. So yes, I would hold the DPU to greater accountability and transparency. I would call out the energy companies that have it really in a chokehold. And I would help lift up the public voices to hold the DPU in, to account uh, and take all legislative measures I could to bring it to a greater overhaul and a greater public accountability. Um, one of the first things, maybe the first thing I, I wrote and introduced in the city council was a resolution against the expansion of the Tennessee gas pipeline. Uh, in, in 2014. And I think Northampton was the first city, there were other towns, but we were the first city to take a formal stand against building a pipeline across uh, western Massachusetts. And I remember going up to Greenfield actually before coming back to Northampton to vote on this and speaking at a rally uh, in the middle of Greenfield. Uh, and it took a lot of dedicated people working together across western Mass, but they defeated it. Uh, I also think we should give recognition to people like Stan Rosenberg, who called on the DPU and told them that they had to hold a hearing in Western Massachusetts as, as recently as the effort uh, well, this year regarding the effort in, in uh, south of us to build new fossil fuel infrastructure that ostensibly would be able to lift the moratorium in Northampton. Let me tell you what else I would do on pipelines. First of all, we need to make it harder to build, actually impossible to build pipelines through Article 97 uh, conservation land. We need to outlaw uh, any of these companies trying to charge ratepayers to build these things. 
And more than anything, we need to make sure that fossil fuels and natural gas are not relevant, that we have different choices. And let me go back quickly to carbon pricing. An important feature of carbon pricing is that we factor in to the total fee the leaked gas that comes from pipelines. That is an enormously important issue for us in Western Massachusetts. We should charge the companies who have leaked and faulty infrastructure. Thank you. The next question comes from the audience, and uh, Jonah will be reading that question, and Chelsea will be the first to answer. What is your position on biomass as an energy source, in particular wood? I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last part of the question? In particular, wood as the biomass. You know, the people of Greenfield spoke back. They clapped back when they were trying to build a large-scale biomass plant in Greenfield. And they said no. They didn't want it. They didn't want the particulates in their air. They didn't want the threat of cutting down forest in order to feed it. When the people speak back, we need to listen. So yes, biomass is supposedly an option, but I don't think that it's a very good option. If we're talking about small scale, like individual wood stoves in people's homes, that is a, a financially feasible way of heating a home, and I don't want to take that away from people. If we can maybe make that more efficient and safer so that there's not rates, higher rates of asthma in, among the children in the, the homes where people have wood stoves, I would love to work on that. But as far as large scale operations, I don't think the evidence is there that, that it's safe and that it's um, a, a, a responsible way for us to go. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, we need to, to really call uh, biomass um, energy uh, production facilities, um, any proposed ones, into question. Um, uh, yeah, on a small scale level, um, maybe not the most efficient uh, or um, uh, best heating method, but um, something that I know that my family uh, relies on um, quite regularly, um, you know, with, with wood burning. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I would I would look at any um, proposals um, that that came through, and I, I would if you know I would want to talk to the people in in uh, the the communities, um, and you know the location I think is key, uh, the scale is key, um, but I, you know generally I, I'm very concerned. So I support renewable, green, and clean energy. I think those are the waves of the future. Um, I recently learned that biomass uh, is a, a greater pollutant than coal. Um, you know, I don't support anything that, that pollutes our environment and uh, contributes to the problem. So, uh, you know, I, I don't support it. I'm opposed generally to biomass. I support clean green energy, class one renewables like wind and solar. I also am, of course, mindful of people who heat their homes with wood. And so, you know, I, I'm really opposed to biomass on the large scale when we talk about a biomass facility, because we just know that investing in that kind of technology or that kind of power is taking us back where we need to be, which is in technology like wind and solar that does not create pollution as it creates energy. And that's where we have to focus. No, simply, I say, let's focus on solar and wind. Uh, again, the, the state Senate's recent uh, bill that was passed um, raises the investment required for, um, for wind. And this is what we should be doing. If, when we're legislating this, Let's, and I think you would all agree, this is about envisioning a different kind of state, a different kind of energy system. This is, when we talk about a clean energy future, it, it takes imagination because there's so much we have to transform. So I say, let's focus on what we actually want. And what I think we actually want is clean energy that is mostly solar and wind. So that's how I feel about it. Biomass, when it first was presented, it was one of those things that everybody goes, oh, we've got a new thing, this will be great. And with the more research and more understanding, we found out it wasn't going to be a good thing. 
And at the time, I lived in Greenfield, and it got defeated, and I was very happy of that. Um, bio, biomass can work temporarily as a tradition, as a transition as we get off of the other fossil fuels, especially in the rural and poorer neighborhoods. There is a cost to the changeover, and we can do it in more wealthy, more middle class neighborhoods. We can do it more in cities and towns than we can in the rural area. They've been dependent on it for a very, very long time. It's going to take longer. But Ryan is right. 100% renewable is 100% clean and renewable. And we have to do away with wood stoves and all of that, pellet stoves, and get to a part where we don't use any of it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Stan, and uh, David Moran will be the first to answer. Okay, this is also a multiple part question that centers on uh, natural gas. Um, do, you, do you think that Massachusetts needs more fossil fu fuel infrastructure, and if so, what kinds of infrastructure would you support? Uh, and if if there are new gas pipelines that are built, should, do you think that electric customers should pay a pipeline tax to help uh, uh, pay for those gas pipelines? And then, because most of the natural gas that's used in Massachusetts consists mostly of methane that has a warming effect about 30 times greater than that of, of carbon dioxide, what legislation would you support to reduce methane emissions? in the state. Okay. Um, that is a multi-part question. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think that we need more fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, I'm, you know, rapidly scanning, um, you know, what, I, what I've read and, and um, studied on. I, I, I really don't see a need. Um, I, I would want to consult with, with experts and with um, legislative colleagues. Um, about about that, but I, I don't I don't believe that there is a, an immediate need um, for more infrastructure in that regard. Um, so I, I don't think that a pipeline tax would be appropriate either. Um, legislative um, in regard to legislative um, solutions to uh, methane, um, I think that we just we need um, caps. We need. Uh, you know, limitations on what sort of stuff is going into our atmosphere. Uh, we, re we really need to just um, enforce uh, penalties if there are, um, you know, if there's poisonous gas uh, and, there, you know, this is, it's extremely damaging to our environment. Um, that's something that is, you know, all of our problem. So I, I think that, um, you know, I, w I would consult with folks and, um, you know, I, I don't think that I could really write a bill off the top of my head that would be, um, you know, really a, a solution to that. But I, I think that, um, that I think that there, things could be done. So if by um, needing more fossil fuel infrastructure, you mean repairing current uh, pipelines, then um, I think that the gas companies need to do that. But if you mean building new pipelines, then um, the answer is no, I, I don't support that. Um, I, I think that we should have a methane tax similar to the carbon tax, and that we should uh, penalize the gas companies that are um, you know, failing to, to fix their infrastructure and leaking huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere. Like you said, it, it um, has a, a really detrimental effect, and um, I don't think that we should let them get away with that. Uh, you know, leaks have to be fixed, and um, they cannot pass that cost on to ratepayers. But I, I, I think, you know, I've said it a, a, a number of times, but the, the, the future is green and clean. Um, you know, fossil fuels are going to be a thing of the past. We can't spend any more money on fossil fuel infrastructure. We just cannot do it. We have to focus on conservation and we have to focus on green technology. So I don't support 
uh, any new gas infrastructure. I don't support a, a pipeline tax. Um, and I do support, however, holding energy companies accountable for pipeline leaks and for air quality monitoring and for having to fix damaged pipes that affect our communities. That kind of holding accountable, those kinds of penalties that have to be levied to energy companies are going to be the kinds of things that both turn energy companies away from fossil fuels and toward investing in clean and green technology. We have to get serious with legislation to hold these companies accountable. Otherwise, we know that profit will be their bottom line. And when profit is their bottom line, they will forsake our communities and they will continue to allow leaks, they will continue to not monitor, and we will continue to suffer as a result and not have the kinds of resources we need to build a green infrastructure. To, to me, building new pipelines, it's kind of like building new highways. You're building this large infrastructure that you think might make the problem better. If, for example, traffic. You say, well, we'll extend a highway and add another lane. All it does is encourage more cars. So when these companies tell you, well, we need to just add a little bit more, a uh, little bit of an extension of the pipeline south of Northampton, then we'll lift your moratorium. What they really want to do is make money and expand fossil fuel use. We have to stand up to that. Um, and certainly with the issue of them fixing their fees, it's their responsibility Fix your own, excuse me, uh, for fixing their leaks. It's their responsibility. Fix your own leaks and don't charge the consumer. This reminds me of the settlement that Volkswagen is in the process of paying out because you saw they kind of were cheating the system in, the, in California. They, they were using, I don't know how to describe it, you know, some kind of diesel system and they were cheating the, the emission standards there. The settlement should be used to build new green infrastructure to finance electric vehicles Doing, asking ratepayers to pay for fixing leaks would be like asking drivers to pay for Volkswagen's mistake. It doesn't make any sense. At the end of the day, this, is, this seems really simple to me. No new fossil fuel infrastructure. As your state senator, I will stand up to that industry and I will lead us in a different direction towards a, a green energy future. No new pipelines. No new fossil fuel infrastructure. That time is over. We'll never transition if we allow that to go on. They're doing it because it's profitable. They make lots and lots of money. And they want to put the cost on us for repairing the old and putting in the new. They did a very similar thing many years ago when they said, we're going to lower your cost of your electricity uh, if you just help us with a little bit of money to close down the plants. Well, that fee, everybody's electric bill went up because the fees that went with a little bit less per unit, it was ridiculous. They're trying to do it again. We need to get out of the business of doing it. Also, the sources of making natural gas so much lower is through fracking. We've been watching the news for years now. It's unsafe. It's dangerous. It's not good for anybody. We've got to stop. We've got to stop with fossil fuels, and we need to support renewables, 100% clean renewables. Thank you. Thank you. We cannot go backwards. I refuse to invest in any more fossil fuel infrastructure. I do not support any more pipelines. I strongly believe that access to clean energy is a human right, and I also recognize that Massachusetts has one of the most expensive energy markets. This is a tension. We need to invest in a diverse portfolio of green and renewable energy options. It is essential. I believe that we need to invest in developing storage for solar and wind power. I believe that we need grid resiliency. We need microgrids. We need community shared solars, and support for community shared solar. We really need to create these tools so that we can move away from fossil fuels for good. Our next question will be asked by Rebecca, and Dave Murphy will be the first to answer. What would you do as our legislator to ensure that the communities most impacted by climate change 
will have access to green jobs and other opportunities as soon as they become available? And how would you give these communities a voice in decision making on policy changes? So you're talking about environmental justice. And um, there's two things that I would do. The first is that um, we can, uh, through our, our community colleges and, and through our institutions of, of higher education, we can um, provide training to people so that they can transition to this you know, new green e economy. Um, I think it's important that everybody has an opportunity to prosper uh, from new technologies. And um, you know, my number one concern is education because it's the great equalizer. Um, the second thing is, in order to give people a, a voice, they need to feel like they, um, first, that, that legislators listen to them, second, that what they do matters. I think a lot of people um, get disenfranchised and believe that uh, you know, one vote doesn't make a difference. Well, I, I've seen elections come down to one vote. Every vote matters and every voice matters. But when you uh, group together and you organize and you have numbers, people can't ignore you. So I think it's critical that people uh, in lower socioeconomic communities, people of color, and um, people who have been disenfranchised, that they understand that their voices matter, that, um, you know, if, if you stand up and you speak out for what is right and you uh, advocate for your communities, that you can make a difference. Um, that's what government is all, all about. So we know that energy security comes with two different things. It comes with the diversification of energy, of clean energy, and it comes with redundancy in our systems. So diversification and redundancy. There are jobs in each of those areas. So in terms of uh, diversity of energy, there are jobs in many different kinds of green technologies, class one renewables like wind and solar. And in terms of um, mitigation and adaptation that has to do with resiliency and redundancy, there are jobs to mitigate climate change, and there are jobs to actually adapt to climate change. So there are jobs, for example, in thinking about water sources. There are jobs in thinking about floodplains. There are jobs in each of these different areas. And so I would work with local communities in this district as your state senator to look at the ways in which we become greater, greater with a greater security mindset around our environment, around our energy sector. And I would work with communities most affected first in the redundancy and the diversification areas. I would invest in training programs. I would bring stakeholders to the table in those communities to make sure their stories are central as we both adapt and mitigate climate change and as we diversify our energy sources. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts is actually one of two states in the country with the right to clean air and clean water written into our Constitution. It's in Article 97, the conservation um, chapter. We need to honor that principle that we have enshrined in our fundamental document in Massachusetts. There has been an environmental justice policy in, in Massachusetts, but it's been an executive policy and it was put in place about 15 years ago. And what it basically does is require cross-agency coordination so that those communities who are most impacted and affected by climate change, by pollution, by toxins, by sea level rise even, uh, have a seat at the table and are involved and are prioritized. This executive policy had not been updated for 15 years. It was only recently updated. What does this show? It shows the importance of legislative leadership. This is a, a thing that we can't depend on the governor for. It has to be codified in law. And my opinion is that whoever you select as your state senator has to lead on this issue because it's not enough to wait for the governor to do it. 
let's take the principles we want for environmental justice, let them guide us, but let's protect them in law just as we protect that fundamental principle in our state constitution. One of the greatest uh, effects of global, uh, of climate change and global warming, if I may use the phrase, is the increase in the water levels in our oceans. What is that doing to our shorelines? It hasn't done great damage yet, but it's starting, and you can see it any time you go to Cape Cod or along the main coast. Those are going to be the environmental justice zones in our future. And guess what? All those people with enough money, they'll be gone. They'll have moved. They'll have found other ways to live. The people remaining are the ones that the state of Massachusetts is going to have to support. We can do that with jobs, and we start by looking at it perhaps as the same level that nationally we looked during the, C during the Great Depression and creating a CCC kind of movement of green jobs and training and getting people. Everybody says that, oh, the unemployment rate is way low. There's a lot of people who just stopped looking and stopped trying for jobs. We could change that, we can turn it around, but it's gonna take a huge effort and Massachusetts could be the leader of that movement. Thank you. I've worked with so many low-income students who are hungry for job training, and they are hungry for a way to make an impact and help the world be a better place. How great would it be if we're talking about incentivizing green jobs here and helping businesses to be greener and cleaner? How great would it be if we developed formal programs for job shadowing, internships, any kind of training programs so that we gave our people in our communities who are looking to learn these skills and looking to give back to their communities and looking to have viable careers in this blossoming, beautiful green industry, and we connected them to businesses so that they could get trainings. I would love to work on formalizing that kind of programming. At the same time, listening to people obviously is essential in the role of an elected official as a public servant. And I will say, I have been a part of the newly created Hampshire Franklin Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. And this is a, a formal way of listening to the concerns of women and girls in Western Massachusetts and amplifying those concerns. I would love to create something similar with a green focus, with an environmental focus. If we could formalize a way of bringing in the voices of low-income people and what they see from, from their perspective of how the environmental changes around them are impacting their daily lives so that we can amplify those concerns. I think that would be a very good way to go. I, I definitely want um, to make sure that people have a voice in, um, in any policy changes, um, particularly those in, in environmental policy changes which could affect their, you know, their communities and their health and, and their livelihoods. Um, it, would be, you know, it would be great if people had more access to clean jobs. It would be great if more people had more access to jobs, generally. Um, but uh, you know, clean energy uh, jobs, um, Jobs that you know aren't involved in um, a polluting or um, you know um, negatively impacting our environment are, are critical, and I, I really think that there's a lot of investment that we could do. Um, the state needs to play a part. Um, it's you know the, the uh, town of Coleraine is not going to be able to get um, you know uh, green energy uh, companies from California uh, to come and and just show up in Coleraine one day and start creating jobs. It's, it's, it, it, the state needs to have a unified um, front in not only um, making our entire commonwealth um, clean and green, but um, in investing in Western Mass. We need to have transportation available for people in rural communities to get to those jobs. Um, and we do need to invest and um, uh, create partnerships with our uh, educational higher ed institutions with uh, public-private partnerships, um, which I think could play a, a really uh, big part in um, just making sure that we have jobs and that these jobs are uh, productive um, towards our larger economy and towards protecting our environment. Thank you. Next question comes from the audience, and uh, Jonah will be reading it, and Joe will be the first to answer. The military industry has a big presence in Massachusetts. Can you please address the climate effects from the military, uh, including 
the carbon footprint from the large use of fossil fuels, as well as the impact of war on the planet, um, and the effect of migration, refugees, uh, et cetera. Wow, that's a sweeping question. And I'm glad to answer it, thank you. So today, people may be following this. Today is a global day recognizing the refugee crisis that is gripping our planet. 65, I believe, million people currently are refugees. They are without a home. That number is expect to grow, expected to grow exponentially over the next years. It is an intersecting crisis with climate, and it's also an intersecting crisis due to war and militarism. So there is the intersection right there. It's being borne by people who are having to flee their homes because they can no longer feed their families, because the climate change ripping their, their parts of their nation is too drastic for them to continue to survive, or they are in a war-torn area. So that's one intersection. And then if you intersect another piece of this story, it's our own US military. So our own US military will tell you that climate disaster is one of the security threats they're most worried about, and yet they are one of the largest causes of pollution. And they are also one of the largest drains of our ability of our federal government to send necessary money down to states like Massachusetts to to infuse our already taxed budget with the kinds of resources we need. So it's all part of this larger conversation that we need to have. Thank you. We talked about a lot of things that we want to do that we feel we might have trouble finding funding for. And there's a little bit of irony in, in my opinion. I feel like we sometimes fight over the scraps in our society. You know, when such a ludicrous percentage of our federal budget goes towards war, let's just call it what it is. We should switch the name of the Department of Defense back to what it used to be, the Department of War. Um, that's what it is. And in an age when we see the fair share amendment get kicked off the ballot, which if it had succeeded and we started to raise the $2.2 billion that we would put back into education and transportation here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it still doesn't erase the giant deficits we built up in the 90s through tax cuts. Yet we're spending all this money on, on war. Um, it's our moral obligation to address the generational challenges that are before us. And I'm someone who believes that politics actually can do that, and that at its best, we rally to make a difference on those things that's, which sometimes feel like can't be changed, but they can be changed. And I think that we can defeat militarism over time as surely as we can address climate change. Um, that's how I think of this, and I think we have no choice but to evolve politically to end war and end climate change. That is quite a question. <clears throat> what I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, is that unfortunately the military is one of our greatest polluters and it also is one of the causes of some of the worst illnesses you want to see. I'm a veteran service officer. I deal with people who have been exposed to Agent Orange every day. People who have been exposed to the burn pits that were over in Iraq in Afghanistan and all the breathing issues and all the things that they're going to suffer with for decades in their lives. The idea that you have a burn pit and everything goes in it. We need to do better. We need to also call on our military to be on top of things when they contaminate the water of Westfield. They've got to step up. They've got to clean it up. If we would get back to an administration, and of course this is federal, but if we could ever get back to some sanity where diplomacy was the primary vehicle rather than constant engagement in war, then maybe, just maybe, we'll do something about the refugee problem. But you cannot blame anybody 
for wanting to get away from Syria, to get away from Iraq. We have war there all the time. People need to go to safety. And if we love our fellow man, we're going to let them in. But let's start by going back to some diplomacy. Thank you. No more funding war. No more. What we can do is we can resist every day. We can use our voices every day to say, no more war. We can pass the Safe Communities Act. We can do work on the local level to make Massachusetts the state that we want to be in, and we can continue to fight back. Along with another woman, I founded the Badass Activists of the Pioneer Valley, which is an activist group that met every Sunday morning, very simple, because I saw people all around me who were feeling such incredible despair about the state of our nation and such hopelessness that they were frozen. They were, they were inactive. They didn't know what to do with themselves. I am an activist in my heart, and I like to bring people along with me. If I am elected as a senator, I will continue to do that work, and I will continue to amplify our voices to resist these policies and this massive <laughs> infrastructure of war machines that we don't want. And I will work to push back and resist and end these practices and hopefully <laughs> it's end war. <laughs> Thank you. I, I share those um, I, ideals. Uh, unfortunately, I, I just really don't see an end to war. Um, I really don't see anything that, that we as a state senator could do about, uh, could do about that. Um, there's a long future ahead of us, um, hopefully, um, with regard to climate change, maybe it might not be as um, long as we would like to think. Um, but we, we need to, to rein in the military industrial complex. Um, we need to absolutely uh, call our elected officials at the national level um, to task um, for taking us on these adventures. Um, I supported President Obama. One of the main reasons um, you know, I, I got involved in his campaign uh, was his opposition to the war in Iraq. Um, we are destroying people's uh, you know, um, societies across the world. We are not nation building in an effective way. Um, when you look at something like Syria, I mean, what do you even do in that situation? It, it's, it's so difficult and people are suffering and I wish that there was something that we could do. Um, but when it comes down to how much money that we spend on our military um, and um, destroying other countries um, and other people's ways of life, um, we need to really just stop doing that. We need to focus on building the United States. We need to focus on um, revitalizing our economy and, um, and not um, hurting other people. In 1961, in his farewell address, General and President Eisenhower coined the term the military industrial complex and warned the world against the, the dangers that it posed because in, in this country, we always have money for war, but we never seem to have money for education, f to uh, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, um, to build affordable housing, to take care of people, to provide for universal health care for all. Um, I think it's disgraceful, and uh, I think that we can do better. You know, we, we fought an unnecessary war in Iraq and spent a trillion dollars. Can you imagine if we had invested that money in education, healthcare, um, clean technology, uh, infrastructure, we'd be a different country. We, we seem to do things backwards oftentimes and what we need are leaders who are willing to stand up and speak out to fight for what's right, to um, you know, stand up to the powers at B, that, that, that be in order to do what is right. And um, that's what I've spent most of my life trying to do, and that's what I would do as your senator. Thank you. We, oops, that was Siri. Um, we have uh, five minutes before we're gonna go to closing statements. So it's not really enough to do a full 90 second uh, response to a full question, but I wonder if we could just take 30 seconds each to say something about how you and your personal lives 
have addressed the need to reduce your use of fossil fuels. And we'll start with Ryan. I'm very fortunate to live in Northampton, a city that um, is committed to sustainability, uh, to walkability, and I've played my own role on, on the city council in encouraging um, that philosophy and seeing that it is actually realized in our planning. Uh, and as we go about the decisions in the city of Northampton, uh, we want our communities to be bikeable and walkable and green. Uh, the city of Northampton has put a solar array in our old landfill, and there's many things that I'm proud of. 30 seconds comes fast. Um, recently, uh, two winters ago, put solar panels on our house so that now we are paying off the panels and no money to the electric company. And uh, in 2007, I bought my own hybrid car, um, which I love dearly, but I drove it a lot. And after about 250,000 miles, I've now sold it to a young person so that they can get to their new job. Uh, I'm saving my pennies for a full electric car coming in the future. But I'm still gonna take the train to the state house. <laughs> I support my local organic farmers by shopping local and organic. I reduce the amount of meat um, that my family eats. I personally am not too excited about meat, but my children on the other hand. Um, I hang my laundry out. Um, I ride my bike whenever possible. Um, and I try to look out for any way that I can possibly take care of the planet and, and reduce my own personal footprint. Yeah, I, I, I walk a, a real lot. Um, I also uh, uh, take the bus whenever I can. Um, as I've openly admitted, my car is a horrible source of pollution um, for this entire Commonwealth, and I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, but I, I, I also do a lot of gardening. It's, it's one of my main passions. It's something that I just do all the time, uh, whenever I can, obviously, uh, depending on the season. And um, I, I particularly enjoy growing squash and tomatoes and peppers. <laughs> so five years ago, I bought a hybrid. Um, I sold it in February, and I haven't bought another car. Um, I am currently riding my motorcycle, which only holds three gallons of gas, um, and gets like 35 to 40 miles a gallon, but uh, I am in the market for a, a new uh, Toyota Prius. Um, you know, so that's a little something that, that I do to keep the environment in mind and to, you know, try to do my part. So my wife Anne and I have two children, and one of the things, one of the commitments we've had is to try to raise them as being environmentally mindful. Um, and so to do that, we do things like all parents do. We run around turning off lights, we pack their water bottles, we use cloth napkins, we hang out the laundry, and we talk about the ways in which our family have to be stewards of the earth and how we need to do a better job of that. So we also raise up those moments where we fall short as a family. And we talk with the kids about that openly. Thank you. We're going to turn now to closing statements. And Steve will go first. Um, thank you. I wish to thank the Climate Action Now Committee and all of the Democratic committees and all the other sponsors of this event. Thank you for um, inviting me. If I am elected to serve uh, our region in the State House in Boston, I pledge to increase our state's use of renewable and sustainable energy. California is the leader on this issue, and I firmly believe Massachusetts can do better and will do better. We can be the leaders on this side of the country. We just need to act now. Why do I feel it's so important? I have the most adorable three-year-old granddaughter. She's got curly hair like my daughter did, and she is precious. And I'm sure many of you have your children and your grandchildren that are precious to you. This is why we have to act. Most of us will be gone when the full effects of global warming hit this world. If we don't act now, our grandchildren, those precious precious little ones that we love so much are going to suffer. I can't think about that. I need to be 
your new set state senator to stop that from happening. Thank you. Thank you all for staying with us on this, this, this sweltering evening here. <laughs> so when I fight for priorities like education equity or single payer health care or our planet, environmental justice, and for strengthening our social fraying, so, so, sorry, our fraying social safety net. <laughs> I do so with my personal experiences and my challenges and my passion and conviction. I fundamentally believe that the state government has the power to lift up all marginalized voices, to provide every child with a great education, to establish free public higher education, to break down systems of oppression, and to protect our earth. But to achieve these monumental goals, we need to have authentic advocates whose lived experiences are impossible to ignore. We need leaders who will repeatedly advocate for the earth. We need leaders who will repeatedly say that black lives matter, who will repeatedly say Muslim lives matter, trans lives matter, and immigrant lives matter. We need advocates who are willing to call for higher taxes on the wealthy, and we need legislators who know what it is to struggle. Thank you so much and good night. Well, thanks again for having us. Um, this has been a really enlightening um, forum, and I'm, I'm really intrigued by the sort of the issue-specific forum um, and the broad range of topics that we've actually we've covered um, tonight. And I, I've learned a lot. Um, again, I, I thank my, my colleagues up here for, for running and, and for their, um, their participation. Um, if, if, if you elect me as your state senator, um, and I am so, would be so honored um, to be your state senator, um, I will not have any level of influence um, from uh, the uh, fossil fuel industry or from any industry or from anyone um, because I will simply not have taken any money whatsoever from anyone. And um, that is something that I'm extremely proud of. And I believe that it would give me um, a lot of um, leverage when it comes to dealing with the, the other um, state senators and the legislators and the governor. Um, that would be something to reckon with. Somebody who had been sent by the people, not by donors, uh, not by special interests, um, but just by the people um, to bring about change and um, reforms. Um, so that's something that I think I can do. I think that um, you know, we need a new generation of leadership. Um, it's it's our, my generation um, that is going to have to face Obviously, these climate issues, um, it's the next generation beyond. Um, we can't just um, sit on the sidelines. We have to get up off the couch. Um, we have to get out in the streets. We have to run for elected office. And we, we have to fight like hell for our values and for what we want out of this country. And um, that's why I'm doing this. I respectfully ask you for your vote, your right in vote, um, for me. David Morin um, on September 4th. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you to Climate Action. Is this one? Oh, thank you. Is, is this working? working? Okay. So thank you to Climate Action. Is the, is the mic working? No. Here we go. Okay, can we switch mics? Yeah, sure. yeah. Thank you. you okay. Thank you to Climate Action for putting this event on. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna dispense with a traditional closing and tell you a short story. When I worked for Senator Montigny on Beacon Hill as his general counsel, um, I, I, part of my job was to be the, the legislative and budget director. And um, so it was my job to know what bills were, were coming before the Senate. And I remember a couple of industry lobbyists coming in one day and um, reading off of their fact sheet and telling me that the, one of the bills that was coming before us that was an in industry-sponsored bill, that it did certain things that I knew it didn't do because it was my job to read the bill and to know what was going on. And I looked at them and I was like, really? Like, you're gonna come into my office and treat me like an idiot because I know that your bill doesn't do that. And I, so I read them the riot act and then I kicked them out of the office. And the reason I tell you this story is because um, when I was in law school, uh, a lot of my classmates told me they went to law school because they wanted to make a lot of money, which to me was sort of just like, 
distasteful. Um, because I went to law school because I wanted to advance my career in the government and make a difference. And that's why lawyers um, go into public service, that's why we become lawyers, um, because we just want to make a difference. And, um, you know, I can make a lot more money in the private sector, but I think that the purpose of life is to, to work to try to change the world to make it better for all, all people and to try to inspire other people to do the same. If um, I, I, I ask for your support uh, to represent this district as your state senator, and together I know we can make a huge difference for the Commonwealth. Thank you. So thank you to the organizers of this evening's debate. By calling us together here, you have demonstrated the power of people to ask folks like us, candidates for elected office, to take important positions on things that matter. That's the power people have, and you've harnessed it this evening. So I started to tell you a story about how Anne, my wife Anne and I, are with our children. So in addition to the things that we talked about earlier, I talked about earlier, you know, we put solar panels on the roof, we catch rainwater, and we invest the kids in doing that work. We talk about old growth trees and the way they catch carbon. Um, and, and yes, we talk about the ways in which our family has to do better. So you can imagine my delight when my son Isaiah this year started taking his bicycle to school. And I asked him one day, Isaiah, you don't want to take the bus? You don't want, to, you don't want me to drive you? And he said, uh, Mom, the planet. <laughs> the planet, Mom. And his moral call to action was so clear. And it's the call that you have, the organizers of tonight, it's the call that you're using, the voices, you're using your voices now in this region and of course across the Commonwealth to call Massachusetts into the place of leadership that we must assume, especially now when no work can happen at the national level. We need Massachusetts to lead us forward. So it's you, it's kids like Isaiah and people with him locking arms that are gonna take us forward into the place that we must be as a commonwealth. And I tell you, I would be simply honored to be your state senator and work with each and every one of you toward a climate future that we know is possible if we muster the strongest possible personal, social, and political will. We can do this work together. Thank you so much. My question to you is, what kind of commonwealth do we want to be when we think about the challenges are, that are before us? Do we want to build east-west rail? Do we want transportation equity in Massachusetts? Do we want to increase the, re the renewable portfolio standard to 3%, but actually beyond that to meet the urgent goals of reducing carbon emissions during a time of great global emergency? Do we want a carbon fee? Do we want to codify environmental justice principles in law? If you were the Massachusetts Senate or the House of Representatives, you would do it before you left this cafetorium, or what do you call this place? A cafetorium? <laughs> it has some kind of newfangled name. But, jail, jail for kids. Okay. But the reality is, as you know, getting this legislation done although urgent, although all important, takes people who have not just commitment, but the desire to go and work the legislative process. And I think we all share that. But let me tell you, I believe in the legislative process as a way to create a better world. I've done it locally in Northampton, and I will use every skill and ounce of experience I have to bring that same philosophy to the state senate. I want to fight for Western Massachusetts, but it's more than just a geographic area to me. It's the principles that make us who we are. That's who we are in Massachusetts. And when I ask the question, what kind of state do we want to be? And how do we want to transform our energy system and, and end global warming? I think we all know what we want to do. Our challenge is to translate those progressive principles into effective action. And I promise you, if you put your faith in me for State Senate, that is what I will work to do every single day on your behalf. Thank you.